Right, I was asked to talk today about growing old disgracefully. Well, I don't know why they picked on me, <laughs> but when I do loose women on ITV, I seem to have had more husbands than the whole of the rest of them uh, put together. And also, I like to think I look better um, than most of them. Um, anyway, it is true that I found out that my, uh, the people that are interested in what I do do span enormously wide uh, age range. Um, and that's flattering, and it's also, it's really good, because I think that the point about me and being me is I say things that people are secretly thinking but are uh, too frightened to say. So I was asked to talk today about subverting the idea of, of what it is to be old. Well, first of all, I don't think I'm old. Do I look old? No. Thank you. I'm a pensioner. So get over it. This is what we look like now. Um, yeah, I'm a baby boomer. I was born at the end of 1946. And um, one of the fascinating things about my life is, my, as I had more and more husbands, my mother said she was so embarrassed by my serial monogamy. And then I found out, or rather the Daily Mail found out for me, that actually she wasn't married when she had me. <laughs> I said, <laughs> before that. <laughs> now, as I've got older, I have noticed that older people, pensioners or whatever we want to call my generation, are generally referred to in the media in terms of the P word, problem. Have you noticed how the P people, the pensioners, are blamed for clogging up hospital beds, claiming free bus passes and rail discounts, more pensioners than ever are staying at work, so we're all bl we're blamed for holding down jobs that other people could be doing allegedly, if they're as smart as we are. Um, <laughs> and my generation are living in houses with spare bedrooms that other people could be living in. Um, and in fact, old people get completely blamed, totally unfairly, for most of society's ills. And today I want to bust a few myths. I want to talk about my experience of getting old, and I want to stress that I regard the ageing process as an opportunity, not a reason to get depressed. My generation, the baby boomers, were the first to be called teenagers, the first to see life in a completely different way to our parents who'd lived through the war and the age of austerity and rash the rationing that followed it. So I grew up in a penny-pinching household, or half a house actually, with an outside toilet, a working class, completely working class family. But my generation were the first that were a separate group of consumers with our own youth culture. So everything from that moment forward focused on youth. We had our own fashion, our own music, and in doing so, we outraged our parents. And as we've got older, we haven't aged like our mums and dads. My parents seemed like dinosaurs when I was a teenager. I used to look at them and think they picked up the wrong baby in the nursing home. I honestly used to look at my mum and dad and they just looked ancient, but probably they weren't even 50. Today, my generation wear the same leisure clothes as people in their 20s and 30s. We're united by shared interests from walking to music. Look at me, I don't shop in a special place called granny clothes, do I? I'll wear whatever I like. Freedom of choice is fantastic. Women today look so different to my mother's generation and these days it's very, very hard to tell someone's age and, incidentally, there's been a huge rise in cosmetic surgery among the over 60s, <laughs> especially among the group known as the silver separators. <laughs> uh, women have got newly divorced and are perhaps seeking to meet someone to replace the bore, the boring old bore that they put up with for far too long. <laughs> So, you know, you've got to completely rethink what it means to be old because cosmetic procedures or Botox or whatever, nips, tucks, pleats, they don't just belong to people under 50. I want to tell you some positive news today about older people. Um, from my viewpoint in London and England, of course, in England and Wales, you'll soon be able to sit on a jury for five more years to the age of 75. Uh, that's because older people are smarter, we're wiser, we've got more life experience and we 
over 65 make up 16% of the population. And if you add in the over 50s, that makes a whopping 30%. And that 30% of the population control 80% of the spending money. By the time we get to 2015, those over 40 will outnumber those under 40 for the first time. So by next year, the balance will have shifted. And yes, there are older people who struggle on pensions and have to scrimp and save, but a large number have more money than ever to spend on health, food and drink and leisure activities. Last month, a study by Age UK found, out, found that 60% of older consumers are willing to try new brands. And that's completely contrary to the widely held belief that old people are stuck in their ways and won't contemplate change. That couldn't be more wrong. And according to a study published in The Lancet, older people are smarter than ever. They did a test on people in their 90s who scored better in IQ tests than, the, than another group of 90-year-olds tested 10 years ago. So 90-year-olds now are super smart and they've got more mobility. Older people also make a new group, are making up a new group of entrepreneurs. One report reveals that business life now is beginning at 60 for this generation that they've dubbed the go for it generation. Instead of sitting back, retiring and vegetating, more older people are setting up new businesses and doing things they haven't had time to do earlier in life. The same study found that people aged 60 or over are fitter, healthier and more willing to try new hobbies than previous generations, from scuba diving to cultural trips abroad. And a charity called the Centre of Ageing Better is being launched with a £50 million grant from the Big Lottery Fund and is setting up a free website to be launched next year which is going to help older people make lifestyle choices designed to improve their quality of life, from diet choices to work and also how to earn more money. Nearly 40% of pensioners now regularly use the internet. Now I'm a big expert on this because my auntie Vi is 78 and I get an email from her every day. Auntie Vi is on Skype 24-7. It's, she's got very bad arthritis, like a lot of old people, she's got very few mobility skills. My auntie Vi and Uncle Ray, Uncle Ray's 88, did a degree in um, Celtic history in their 70s. They only watch the Discovery Channel and the History Channel and the News Channel and they read The Independent. But Auntie Vi, more importantly, in a previous generation, would have been reduced to writing to relatives overseas and friends overseas by airmail and waiting weeks for a reply. Now she's got the, she knows what new ornaments my nephew has on his sideboard because every night they're holding up the bloody thing and walking around the room and Skyping each other. And uh, my cousin has just become an older dad at 46 and Auntie Vi talks to the baby every night on Skype. She's got, to, she's absolutely the silver surfer role model for other crumblies. <laughs> Ad agencies say that it's a mistake to pigeonhole older people to lump them all into one group and I agree. They say that today's 45 to 65 year olds are truly the first multimedia generation, that this age group use new technology, they use the internet across many platforms and they still consume traditional media at the same time, like newspapers, books, and magazines. And Auntie Vi and Uncle Ray are the perfect example. Yes, they read their books. Yes, they're on their texting, but they're on the internet as well. In rural areas, 
we see the growth of the internet, but also I've got a house deep in uh, rural Yorkshire, and what's really interesting there is that the older people have been drawn into the community through pro uh, particularly that choral program on the television, the choir program, saw a huge increase in the number of people who thought that I can sing and I can be in the choir and it's not something I can't do. And the other thing in rural communities is that village halls, which used to just be for the domino drive and the flower arranging, now have a huge range of activities going on, going on in them as younger people have got onto the committees and kind of slightly broken the stranglehold that some of the old fogies used to have on them. The other thing that's really interesting is that learning a musical instrument and playing in a band in your 70s is not seen at all weird these days. And ask yourself why. Look at the Rolling Stones. <laughs> all the most popular musicians today are old crocs. Clearly, age is no barrier to success. Before I wanted to talk uh, much more about um, how personally what I said, how important the arts and culture is in my life, I just wanted to cite a few inspirational role models People who demonstrate clearly that age doesn't diminish talent, doesn't, uh, that age doesn't mean that talent diminishes or cre creativity wanes. Now, you might not like all these people, but they're still really fascinating, important people. Vivian Westwood, 72. She's barking mad, she just cut off all her hair, but she has a clothing business, global clothing business, worth billions, and is now don't we know about it, a spokeswoman for climate change. But, you know, she's out there doing it and she's changed the whole idea of what a fashion designer should look like. Judy Dench, 79, nominated for an Academy Award, starred in the, uh, the film Philomena and has been in numerous James Bond films. Isn't letting losing her sight stopping her, stop her working. She says people read the scripts to her now and she's still going to continue to work. Someone very close to my heart, architect Zaha Hadid, 63. She was at the same college as me, after me, and she's the first woman to win the Pritika Architecture Prize and she's won the Sterling Prize for Architecture twice. She's built airports, museums, theatres and art galleries all over the world and in London she built the Aquatic Centre for the Olympics, which has just opened to the public, offering swimming and diving lessons for everyone. Artist Maggie Hamlin, she's 68. Fantastic artist. Designer Terence Conran, 82, still going strong. Industrial designer James Dyson, 66. Brian Friel, playwright, author and director, 85. Just had a play after play on at the Crucible in Sheffield, given four stars by The Guardian. Well, musicians, I mentioned a few crocs earlier, but I've obviously I can't ignore Van Morrison, 68, still as batty as ever. Um, he's got a new studio album, No Plan B, it gets four stars in Rolling Stones and Billboard. And his pub uh, book's been published in his lyrics, celebrating 50 years in the business. Then look at artists. They don't diminish with age. Matisse has got a huge exhibition on at the Tate Modern opening in April, focusing on the last 14 years of his life where he found new, renewed energy and had a beautiful Russian-born assistant helping him. <laughs> I wonder how. Eileen Gray, one of my favourite uh, interior designers who was designing well into her 90s. And writers, Frank McCall, <coughs> Published his first memoir in his mid 60s. Mary Wesley, she died at age 90 by having her uh, amazed the literary world, having her first novel published when she was 70. P.D. James, she wrote Death Comes to Pemberley, aged 90. So there you go, my case rests. You can be brilliant and creative right to your very last breath. <laughs> and I suppose. Uh, I don't want to put myself up there with those people who have achieved worldwide fame and glory. But what I would say about myself, which you heard in the introduction, is that I am a polymath or whatever that means. I'm, you know, I, I have done lots of things in my life. I trained as an architect and by the time I was I, uh, 21 I switched to journalism and I was a columnist. 
in, uh, I appeared on television in my, for the first time in my late 20s, but I've always written a newspaper column uh, all the time. Uh, by the time I was in my 40s, I was a BBC executive, uh, and then in my 50s, I edited a national newspaper, The Independent on Sunday. Now, I'm in my late 60s, I write three news, uh, columns a week. I write one for the Daily Mail, I write one for the Independent on Sunday, and I write one for Yahoo. I work for every single TV channel. I don't limit myself to working in one genre. I do reality shows, Question Time, I do Loose Women, and I did MasterChef. Uh, a couple of years ago, I, did, I wrote an hour-long documentary on the genius of British art, uh, post-war British art, for Channel 4. I've also written quite a lot of books. I thought I'd written six, but I read in my book I've actually written seven. <laughs> and, um, this one, Life Too Fucking Short, has been published in 14 or 15 countries, even in Turkey. I don't know what they made of that cover, yeah. as the cover was in Turkish of my copy. I'm not sure, quite sure how they translated it. But this book kind of encapsulates my philosophy, which is life too short to do all the things that bore you, that you don't need to do. Just get on with what you want to do, get up every day and say, I am completely brilliant, I'm intelligent, I'm the smartest person I know. <laughs> Spend five seconds saying that because no one else is going to say it. <laughs> That's true. Anyway, I've just uh, curated uh, a, a season on post-war British architecture uh, for BBC Four. Some of the programmes have been showing in the last couple of weeks and I wrote an essay about housing for the website. So you can see I've done loads of different things. I did a one-woman show at the Edinburgh Festival, and also I did I'm a Celebrity. Um, but the one thread running through my life is a passion for the arts. I'm absolutely passionate about art. I, I couldn't imagine a day without looking at a painting or going to a gallery or going to the theatre or engaging with the arts. And I believe that is food for my brain. Also, I've got this capacity to live in the present. I don't dwell over the husbands, the failures, <coughs> any of that old rubbish. I just focus on today and what's going to happen next. I refuse to wallow in nostalgia or dwell on failure. I just don't do it. I've just wiped it from my brain. People often come up to me that Probably not. I just if, I, if they were boring, I'd wipe them. I'm sorry, I've edited them out. I didn't write that in this book. Well, I'm not for that. Uh, the other thing that really colours my thinking and my choice in what I'll do, uh, what work I'll take on. I don't work less than I used to. I work actually more now. Uh, the thing that drives me is I want to do things that I haven't done before. So I've climbed mountains. I haven't. Uh, climbed before, I've done walks I haven't walked before, and I've done things I haven't done before, like I did a documentary series for the ITV where I was a teacher, and I did another one where I delivered babies, so I wasn't very good at that, <laughs> <laughs> but I had a go, I did a lot of wiping. Um, but by constantly trying new things, this is what I think you have to get across to uh, older people who are nervous. You must try new things because that way your mind doesn't close down. It doesn't atrophy. You've got to be receptive to new ideas. I do think that older people are naturally cautious. They hide their loneliness. They also need to feel useful. They want to be useful. They have valuable mentoring skills which we're not using in the world of employment, or in many community activities. I've visited Japan a, a great many times over the years, and in Japan, older people, like the legendary potter, Bernard Leach, uh, sorry, Bernard Leach, are designated living treasures. So an old person who's achieved something is a living treasure in Britain. Now, in Japan, that's what we need to think about our senior citizens. We should stop looking at them as problem people and start looking at them as living treasures because they're a huge untapped resource that we can learn from and benefit from. 
Throughout the 70s, 80s and 90s, as I've said earlier, there was a focus on youth culture and I was one of the uh, guilty people who made hundreds of programmes about it for the BBC. But now the balance has shifted. It's true that older people worry too much about dementia. Every day I get up and try to remember what I did last Wednesday at 2 o'clock to prove I haven't got dementia. Cancer your finances, you do have a little secret <coughs> worry position in your head that never goes away. But what could help, what can really help you deal with that is getting engaged in community activities and the arts. <coughs> a really good example of community activities that I've experienced that benefit a wide age range is at my tennis club in Kent, where the players range from <coughs> 7 to 75. The older blokes built the clubhouse and they ran the fundraising activities and for them the club's a vital meeting place where they can just turn up and hang out. In Yorkshire, my village band, uh, the brass band, is always on the lookout for new members and the players range from 15 to 85. We must change the mindset that arts events belong to younger people and that community activities and not necessarily for them. I freely admit that the worst thing about joining anything is the first 15 minutes. So you have to go into people's homes and help them make that first step in. As I've talked about my auntie Vi, the for the totally housebound, need to be taught computer skills and how to Skype. They can belong to book clubs and join learning courses. What they don't want to have happen is that we come along and patronise them. I walk every day of my life, and what a great way that is to meet people. Writing is a solitary occupation, and so actually is a lot of my walking, because for me it's thinking time. But what I acknowledge is that I must talk to people. Otherwise, I'd be spending too many hours of the day looking at a computer screen and being alone. I've got to stop texting, get off Twitter and stop email. The most important thing is to have face-to-face -face contact. Conversation is a valuable skill we must not lose. My mother certainly gave it up. She was a complete conversation-free zone for the last few years of her life. I bring her up every Sunday, same time, ask her how she was, and I get the answer, all right. I say, done anything this week? No. <laughs> What's the weather been like? Dreadful. <laughs> well, that is unfortunately what happens if you don't find a way to build conversation with people. Finally, I'd say that older people do need a voice. They deserve a positive, not negative image. They need to feel valued and that they can contribute to society. We need to make sure that their world does not shrink as they age. The arts and the kind of activities I've talked about today are a vital tool in enriching their lives and improving not just their mental health, but their physical strength too. All they need is encouragement. Thank you.